voy a ir a... Sí, sí, eh, buenas tardes. Le voy a pedir a los asistentes que están arriba disfrutando del café, si, si vienen al panel E, que por favor eh, vayan bajando para acompañarnos, porque vamos a empezar ya... Vamos a empezar ya el panel E. Si nos acompañan, por favor. Sí, vamos a empezar el panel E. Dicen que empieza. Ah, ahora sí, o es esto. No, no, ahora sí. Ah, vale. Muchas gracias. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, good afternoon. I think it's a, it's a little bit a difficult time slot that we have, but I hope that the topic is going to be so interesting that we will get a little bit more crowd to discuss with us. Um, let me just quickly introduce myself. My name is Johannes Krasnitzer. I'm the coordinator of the UNDP Art Initiative. Um, and I'm very thankful, I have to say, to the Spanish government and many of its institutions that we have this event here, that we are really, after one year, on working, formulating, and, and, and thinking together, get this result that there is a lot of high-level participants committing to the localization of the SDG. So a warm thank you up to the Spanish government as our hosts, including, of course, the government of Cabo Verde and the government of Ecuador, who have accepted to be co-hosts of this important event. Um, we will discuss with, the, with our panelists, which, will, which I will introduce to you in, in a couple of seconds, a topic that is many times overlooked. Uh, we have discussed today already the institutional frameworks at the national level, but now in the afternoon we will talk a little bit on necessary institutional frameworks at the local level. Um, what are we talking when we talk institutional frameworks? Once in a while, even though being a development professional for, for 25 years, I looked it up and um, the definition um, that I got from Wiki is the system of formal laws, regulations, and procedures, and informal conventions, customs, and norms that shape the socio-economic activity and behavior of a society. So we are talking 
the, the formal side of laws and environment, but we're also talking about the informal arrangements and society gives in order to shape our socio-economic behavior. This is exactly what the SDGs, what the new agenda is about. If we want the new agenda, the 2030 agenda, to have an impact at the local level, we need to rethink that kind of arrangements, institutional arrangements that we have in between governments, civil society, private sector. We can have the best plans for SDGs, we can have the best strategies for SDGs. If we don't have the institutions and the governance for these institutions in place, it will be very difficult to achieve the results that we all want to achieve. Um, with that little introduction, um, I would like to, with a couple of words only, introduce the panelists to you, starting already, um, I will not introduce in a certain order, but we will start with Alcidia Alfama, National Planning Ministry of Finance and SDG, National Focal Point in the Government of Cabo Verde, being one of the host governments, is with us. You have served in many different functions to the, to the Government of Cabo Verde as advisor, senior advisor in the Ministry of Economy General, the cabinet of the Prime Minister of Cabo Verde, and at the moment a very important and also um, relational focal point to the initiatives that UNDP and the other UN agencies have for localizing the SDGs in Cabo Verde. Um, then, just going on, Gustavo Barroja, the prefect of the provincial government um, of Pichinche and the president of Conjope. Conjope um, is the, most of you will know, is the consortium of provincial governments of Ecuador. I mean, you have a long track record, I think since 2006, as um, the prefect of Pichincha and as 2014 also the president of Congope. So we will get the vision of a national government, the vision of a local government, but also association of local governments. Then, and this is also going to be a, a little bit a longer introduction, Luc van den Brande, um, the former president of the European Committee of the Regions, which we are happy as UNDP also to have a very close relationship in localizing the SDGs, and the former president of Flanders, where I happen to know that also Flanders is very active in implementing the SDGs uh, today. Also a former Belgian minister of labor and employment, former prime minister of the Flemish region, and currently um, the president of the European Center of Workers' Questions and an advisor uh, to Mr. Juncker, I, I understand. Just one single uh, quick remark. Uh, most of you know probably that the Committee of Region has also another big meeting here in Sevilla, um, the Harlem meeting, and um, Mr. Van Brande will have to go to the other one as we're a little bit late. He might um, just sneak out in about an hour or half an hour's time. So this is not because he finds it very uninteresting what we are discussing, but, but it will be it will be necessary to attend also to the other. Then, I'm very happy to have Mohand Lancer, the president of the Association of Moroccan Region with us. Um, you have been the president of the, of the Association of Moroccan Region since 2016. Um, you're also the president of FES Meknes Regional Council and a former ministry of the Kingdom of Morocco. So we will get both perspectives, I, I would assume, the national as well as then the local perspective. Um, and we have, of course, and I'm very happy to have here a mayor, Nurani Roslan, the mayor of Subang Yaya in Malaysia. Um, um, and you have been also the, um, the president of the district council of Kuala Selangor from 2011 um, onwards. And you have a background, I understand, also in town planning, which is, of course, extremely relevant. And last but not least, Carlos Gil Santiago, the mayor of Benavites in Spain, um, which um, has a background as a university professor, and I think maybe we can get also both perspectives, because I do think that also universities, the academia, play a, uh, play a very important role in this kind of institutional setup, as well as the perspective of a mayor, as you are. Um, I would like to... Um, start out maybe in the, in the same order as we had, and I would like to invite Althidia to give us a little bit of perspective, a short introduction of what is Cabo Verde doing in, in kind of fomenting these institutional frameworks 
that we consider so important um, for the localization of the SDGs. Please. Johannes, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organization for inviting Cape Verde to be here today and present its experience on the implementation of the SDGs and uh, localizations of the SDGs. Uh, as the minister told us today morning, uh, the implementation of SDGs in Cape Verde happened in a very favorable moment. Uh, it was, uh, it, it, it happened uh, after the recent approve the, our strategic planning uh, for the horizon of 2017-2021. Uh, uh, there is a plan that is completely aligned with the SDGs. Uh, however, our government, we do think that uh, the success of this implementation uh, really depends on the, its integration, not only uh, its integration into national planning, but uh, to translate them into actions that can really uh, affect people and really support people uh, to not leave no one behind and not leave no highland behind. Uh, I would like today, I would like to, to talk, to present you a little bit about, about our what the country is doing to localize the, the SDGs. Uh, Cape Verde had uh, its independence in uh, 1975. Uh, and since then, uh, Cabo Verde has made remarkable progress uh, in its 43 years of indep independence. However, we are a highland country uh, and we suffer from the insularity for the dispersion of the island. Uh, so we continue to be a, a country with deep vulnerabilities, uh, and we have huge inequalities and, uh, within the population and asymmetries uh, within, um, between the, the 10 islands. Uh, our Sustainable Development Strategic Plan uh, has uh, four structuring uh, objectives. And one of them is to ensure social inclusion and to reduce these inequalities and asymmetries between the territories. So to valorize uh, the potential of each region and to correct these regional asymmetries, uh, Cape Verde, the government, decided not only to elaborate uh, a new strategic plan, but also to regionalize uh, this strategic plan. What we did, uh, we did identify the potential and needs of each uh, territory. Uh, we made a deep diagnosis of the territory, and what we are trying to do now is to territorialize our policies. Um, I would like to, to present to you uh, one successful program that we are implementing now is the local platform uh, for achieving the SDGs in Cabo Verde. It, this local platform is a joint effort between the government of Cape Verde, UNDP, and it's financed by the government of Luxembourg. Uh, it is a program that was born from this necessity to mainstream the SDGs at the local level and to promote this enabling institutional environment that allows integration and coordination between priorities, policies, and programs at the local level. Uh, we are promoting now a platform uh, that are allowing all stakeholders to work together and to decide how local resources should be used for environment, uh, for structure like infrastructure, service, uh, and other financial needs. Needs, yes. Ma ma many thanks, Elsie. I think um, for that kind of initial statement, I think it has been very. Okay. Let me follow up with one question because I have the advantage to know a little bit the program that you just mentioned um, about the local platforms. Is there any intention? And the local platform is really bringing all the different actors together in the territories, being the private sector, being the academia, 
between the national government and the local governments. Is there an intention to institutionalize these kind of platforms which have been introduced within the framework of a project so that we really have a kind of a longer term um, sustainability of these kind of processes? Is that? Uh, I think we are already institutionalizing it because we are expanding. Uh, we now have the program, uh, we have 22 municipalities and 11 of them actually are already, eight of them are, are already concluded, are inserted in the program and uh, other three are in the process. Okay. okay. So what we need now is to expand and to... Perfect. Many things, and we can talk okay. later on. Let me maybe ask uh, Mr. Luc van den Rande to be able to get also to hear from him a little bit more as he will have to leave us. Maybe your first impressions, your take on local institutions. Um, is that important, really, if we want to implement the SDGs? As uh, a matter of fact, uh, it is not, uh, in my view, about uh, the formal uh, status nor from countries, because you can be a uh, totally centrist organized country, or you can be a federate country, or you can be a decentralized country, but uh, in any case, you have the local level. And for me, uh, let's say, as the concept of community, the local level is the circle of belonging, which is the most tangible, which is the most uh, effective, which is the most real. And uh, I will not refer uh, especially to my own region, Flanders, in uh, uh, the Kingdom of Belgium, but I will shortly give uh, our approach uh, of the Union's Committee of the Regions, one of the advisory uh, uh, institutions, organs. Uh, we have to give uh, advice, and uh, by nature, the uh, members of the Committee of the Regions are local responsible, are regional responsible, mm -hmm. and coming from all uh, uh, the member countries of the Union. We are saying, rightly, that uh, the two main principles of uh, democratic governance related to behave of people, we cannot make the disconnection of it, that the two main principles for the Union are the principle of proportionality, where we have to act proportionate with the goals we want to reach. Mm. But the other principle is the principle of subsidiarity. And what does it mean, subsidiarity? There are a lot of theories about. But uh, let's uh, go to the simple. Subsidiarity is about the best delivery in the benefit for the people and at new you cannot say that uh, you have to do everything at the local level, but uh, the local being the most natural is essentially also for the SDGs important uh, uh, to say we have to localize the common goals and the common challenges. Now, uh, coming back to this principle of subsidiarity and not go for a long theory, we are always looking and uh, giving uh, content to the principle of subsidiarity may I say, in an institutional way. The local, the province, the regional, the nation, Europe. But we are often forgotten that, for me, the even more important dimension of subsidiarity is the horizontal dimension. Because it's an illusion to think that only institutions are able to achieve. And it is an illusion to think that only the local or the national can do uh, something. So this is the reason that we have to give not just room, but also responsibility to the actors in our society. And the actors in our society are evidently the economic actors, the social actors, the educational actors, the uh, cultural actors, and so on. And this is, let's say, for me, uh, very strongly related to the concept of SDG that there is intertwining. We cannot say this is a part of, uh, let's say, our challenges. Things are to be seen global, are to be detected. And that's an important point. Uh, before to think in terms of commitments, I think for me and for us it's important to go for a co-detection of uh, the needs we have, the challenges they are in place, identifying together what has to be done. 
And then, of course, you have to see in which way uh, it can be done. And as always in life, we have the three main questions, the why, the what, and the how. And those three are interconnected. And that's the reason why to co-identify the situation and then to co-govern in the wide mm -hmm. sense of the word and to see in which way we can deal with the matter. So, due to the fact that uh, you cannot disconnect the one level to the other, you cannot disconnect the institution from, in fact, the architecture of society, may I use this word, uh, uh, to reach the goals we want to reach, we have to go for a kind of holistic approach where everybody is about. And then we are touching the big issue of real participation, the participatory democracy, the participatory concept of uh, building up societies. And this is uh, meaningful because it is not just about information. Mm. Information is, is a prerequisite. But uh, above information, there has to be real dialogue in full respect of all partners. And like uh, Jürgen Habermas was saying, you have to deal with uh, all people in our society, the institutional and the not institutional ones, as equal partners. And not to say the one is the leader and has to say what uh, has to be done by the others. And this is the real meaningful concept of participatory democracy. But the other point is in terms of responsibility, of accountability. It is not just enough that we are saying we have to reach all the goals together in the different ways we are facing it. But there has to be an engagement. It is more than just uh, to be around the table and to agree on. You have not, uh, this is the most easiest thing, to convince the convinced. But there has to be an engagement as well. And it brings me to, uh, at this moment, uh, mm -hmm. the other point. That is uh, already Felipe Gonzalez, uh, when he was working uh, years ago on, uh, in, on behalf of uh, what was called uh, a Committee of Wise Men to look up uh, the 2030 yeah, uh, of the Union, that we have uh, to rethink the responsibility and accountability. Yeah? Because when you give a place to people to commit themselves, I think that is also the responsibility to be taken by those people. And this brings me to the idea or the approach that uh, more than to be together, more than have the common insights, more than co-identifying and co-creating solutions, there has to be also a notion of contractualization. Mm -hmm. That there has to be a kind of contract uh, to be put in place where people are committing themselves but are also committing themselves to deliver something. No. And one just practical example, when we were working uh, years ago on uh, the covenant of mayors uh, on uh, climate change at that mm -hmm. moment and so on, it was not just to say, okay, uh, sign this paper, but it was also to make a, a very uh, clear model to say, we will commit ourselves to deliver for our own city, for our own local community, year by year, and to fulfill Absolutely. our engagement. So there are some of the points, and by the way, but uh, it's another story, there are in, uh, at this very moment, a lot of stakeholders, uh, uh, agreements, stakeholders uh, organized by the European Commission, the Committee of the Region, and so on. That's fine. But we have to go beyond this, uh, let's say, formal commitment. People are to be really in place as equal partners, as part of participatory democracy, the Absolutely. only way to reach the goals. Thank you very much. There's a lot of interesting concept that you introduced, which I want to use that once we have the first round, just like as a heads up, I would like to already engage you. If you have any one or two questions to the panelists that could then inform the second round. So please do start thinking if you think the topic is interesting, if you have something, and um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that we will um, engage in the second round, that it still will be the time, but I would be interesting then to see like in one of the important institutions of the European Union, the Committee of Region that you presided, how is the relationship then to the local institutions within the region? Is there a role to play like really to strengthen that framework through the, but let's take this for the second round maybe so. 
we, we, we can get also a little bit to the others. Please. Buenas tardes con, con todos y todas. Tal vez vale también introducir algunos elementos adicionales, coincido plenamente con el representante de Flandes, tal vez muestra la experiencia ecuatoriana. El marco jurídico y normativo existe. Tenemos una constitución aprobada en el 2008 que es garantista de derechos de todos los seres vivos, mm. incluido la naturaleza. Tenemos una constitución que garantiza la participación ciudadana para definir el destino de su territorio, en la estrategia a seguir, en la definición de proyectos y programas. Tenemos una constitución que te habla del plan nacional, un plan nacional al cual deberíamos ir dirigido todos los gobiernos subnacionales. Y obviamente también se habla de un modelo de gestión descentralizada. Es decir, tenemos un aparato constitucional que puede responder claramente a estas necesidades de la aplicación de los ODS en el territorio. Sin embargo, la planificación nacional no responde a la planificación local. Entiendo yo que debería contener la planificación nacional, la planificación desde la parroquia, este debe estar contenida en la planificación cantonal, lo cantonal en lo departamental, lo provincial, lo estatal, como se pueda llamar, y lo nacional que comprenda íntegramente todo el proceso de planificación. Así se puede responder a las preguntas del anterior panel, donde si tenemos una planificación de ese corte y estratégica a varias decenas de años, no importa qué gobernante llegue, no importa si es de otro, de otro color político, lo importante es esa planificación de carácter nacional y desarrollada. Y hay también procesos de, de participación ciudadana. Pero todo esto, todo esto que hablo de la participación, que hablamos también del hecho de la descentralización, responde también a voluntades políticas. Y obviamente nuestra planificación no tiene ese carácter. Es una planificación que no responde claramente a la respuesta que deberían tener los intereses de la ciudadanía en el territorio. Y una participación que no es real. Lo decía también el representante Flandes. Esta participación tiene que ser real, desde el sueño de cómo ver su territorio hasta el manejo de los recursos en cada uno de los gobiernos subnacionales. Para nosotros, entonces, es fundamental no solamente el marco jurídico institucional que se pueda tener, sino la voluntad política de que las políticas puedan aplicarse en el territorio y eso para nosotros tiene que ser demasiado importante. Pero también ahora debemos ver objetivos y metas de carácter coyuntural que no están tomadas y creo que son nuevas y vale la pena tomarlas en cuenta. Lo que tiene que ver con el cambio climático. Hay movilidad humana por cambio climático. Hay expulsión en muchos países por cambio climático. Y eso es un tema a tomarse en cuenta, es un tema a considerar. Y el otro es el tema de la garantía de la paz. Mm. La guerra afecta cualquier forma de desarrollo sin discriminación. El cambio climático no tiene discriminación con los que tienen o no tienen recursos, con los que tienen o no tienen plata, con los pobres o los ricos. Y obviamente la garantía de la paz es fundamental y deberíamos fijarnos también objetivos y metas en relación a eso, que no están tomadas en cuenta en los objetivos de desarrollo, pero que sí son actores fundamentales de propuesta en, a lo interno de nuestros, de nuestros territorios. Y tal vez vale la pena señalar que lo fundamental de territorializar los objetivos permite que obviamente estos se puedan cumplir. Los gobiernos locales, los gobiernos provinciales son los que tenemos y vemos al vecino permanentemente, a diario, a diario. Y tenemos que enfrentar sus quejas y tenemos que enfrentar sus problemas y tenemos que darle a salida a cada uno de ellos. Entonces, un objetivo claro de todos los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible es la territorialización, es la desagregación en los gobiernos locales de los objetivos de desarrollo. Perfecto, muchísimas gracias. Um, thank you very much. I think again, um, a couple of really important concepts, passwords, political Voluntad política, no? um, it's, it's one of the things that you really mentioned, without that we will not. I mean, institutions alone is also not enough. We need also to have the, the political willingness and committedness. Let me hand it over maybe to um, our colleague from uh, Morocco, because it's also the same perception a bit from an association of regional governments. We heard from an association of um, regional governments or, 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 or provincial governments in, in Ecuador. So is Is the, the situation, the context very different in North Africa and Morocco, or would you subscribe to what we just heard? Or what, what would be the differences there in, in, in approach? 
Je voudrais à mon tour remercier les autorités espagnoles et les organisateurs qui m'ont invité. Mais en même temps, vous dire que quand j'ai reçu la lettre d'invitation, je me suis un peu posé la question. Est-ce que réellement les, les objectifs de développement durable, nous n'avons commencé à, à nous en occuper qu'après 2015 ça m'a ça, ça, ça travaillé parce que en 20 ans de gouvernement, c'est toujours l'objectif que nous avons, c'est effectivement d'éradiquer la pauvreté, de développer, etc., etc. Et nous avons même fait, accompli des choses assez intéressantes. Et alors, je me suis posé la question, mais alors qu'apporte l'agenda 2030 Et c'est là que je me suis aperçu qu'en fait, il n'apporte pas des objectifs nouveaux, il apporte une façon d'évaluer et de mesurer les progrès que nous faisons dans euh, ce domaine. Alors là, pour vous parler du Maroc, bien sûr, je peux vous parler du niveau régional, mais je crois qu'il oh, ne faut pas le couper, il faut commencer par le, le national, c'est tout à fait normal. Nous avons eu la chance euh, au Maroc d'avoir euh, tous les niveaux, toutes les strates du pouvoir qui sont impliqués dans l'agenda 2030 et la réalisation des objectifs depuis le roi, qui a envoyé un discours donc, à la réunion des, des Nations Unies de 2016. Le Maroc a été parmi les 21 euh, premiers pays qui ont présenté un rapport en 2016. Le gouvernement en a fait également ce, ce, son affaire. Donc il y a une application très forte, très forte et un intérêt manifeste. Et on a même vu, euh, je peux même vous citer, des ministères qui se sont appropriés certains des objectifs qui les concernent, ministère de la Santé, ministère de l'Éducation nationale, qui ont mis en place des outils euh, de mesure et, et d'évaluation. Tout récemment, la Cour des comptes, qui est la plus haute autorité s'occupant de la reddition des comptes, vient de sortir en janvier un rapport d'évaluation sur la réalisation des, o, des ODD au Maroc. Un rapport qui n'a pas été tendre parce qu'il montre effectivement qu'il y a encore des choses sur lesquelles il faut travailler, surtout l'aspect statistique et l'aspect effectivement de mesure et d'évaluation. Alors, en partant de là, je vous dirais que, indépendamment des ODD et de l'agenda, des mesures très importantes ont été prises au Maroc pour montrer l'intérêt. Le plus grand aujourd'hui, le la plus grande ferme solaire, le plus grand projet d'énergie solaire, euh, nous l'avons effectivement au, au Maroc. Le, le, en matière d'urbanisme de, de construction, nous avons introduit des principes d'efficacité énergétique depuis déjà cinq ans ou six ans. J'étais ministre de l'urbanisme à l'époque, mais en fait, ce n'est pas, pas pour ça que je l'ai fait. Donc, il y a, il y a cette volonté d'y aller. Et alors, je me suis posé la question sur les régions et sur les collectivités. Je parlerai des régions que je connais, je connais aussi les autres collectivités. Sur les régions, je peux vous dire que jusqu'à présent, sauf si un de mes collègues me corrige, mais on, en est, on est 12, on se connaît, je suis président, nous n'avons pas encore, nous ne sommes pas inscrits en, en, en nous obligeant à mettre, la, disons, des objectifs dans, dans notre action. Nous le faisons, mais sans penser aux objectifs, ni à ce qu'il faut faire avec ces objectifs. C'est peut-être parce que la régionalisation nouvelle forme au Maroc est très récente. Elle date de 2015. Mm -hmm. Les textes nous donnent beaucoup de pouvoir et surtout en matière de développement durable, si vous prenez les compétences propres des régions, nous avons une, un, un, un très grand, euh, une très grande souplesse. Nos ressources financières, même si elles restent faibles, ont été multipliées par 5 entre 2014 et aujourd'hui, nous avons cette possibilité d'agir avec la société civile, d'abord parce qu'on est obligé par la loi d'avoir des conseils consultatifs, trois au moins, jeunesse, euh, égalité de genre, euh, économie, et euh, nous avons aussi la possibilité d'aider la société civile, des associations qui, elles, font beaucoup, sont impliquées dans le développement durable. Nous avons les outils de planification qui sont permis, surtout le schéma régional d'aménagement du territoire, qui est l'un des outils aussi. Et je pense que maintenant, effectivement, nous sommes à la phase de faire descendre la stratégie nationale de développement durable du niveau national à une stratégie régionale qui permettra effectivement de mieux asseoir 
ce, cette mesure des progrès accomplis et de corriger notre action. Et c'est ce que je souhaite à tout le monde. Merci. Thank, thank you very much. Um, again, very important to remind us that when we are talking about local institutional frameworks, when we are talking about localizing the SDGs, we do have very different local government stratus within the local or within the regional, because not all the local governments, regional, provincial governments do have the same functions to the contrary. So we need to look for complementarity. Um, as you told us that the regions might not yet be there, though it's very important to have the national level. The most, the ideal scenario would be to have this multi-level governance that includes with one institutional framework from the national or as we take the European Union from the supra, uh, supranational to the local level. Helping me to maybe ask you to also consider in your short statement as a mayor, so as a mayor, as the one that is on the most local level of government, what is your relationship to the upper levels of government in terms of implementing the SDGs, or are you there more concerned um, only, with, only with your municipality? And maybe the second one, um, as I mentioned beforehand, the informal institutions. Being a mayor in the Malaysian context, are you dealing there also as local government with informal institutions? Are you taking that seriously in order to create that overall consensus? Please. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, Subang Jaya Municipal Council is in the middle of preparing our new local plan. Uh, the local plan is a requirement under the law, Town, plan, town and Local Planning Act, uh, to be prepared for the local authority in accordance to the national planning, uh, uh, national development plans, national urbanization policies, and the state structural development plan. Uh, and incorporating the sustainable development agenda has been consciously done since the uh, local agenda development in uh, Brandon's report. Um, so um, in this new local plan, um, right now that we are going to have the public hearing uh, to let the public um, air their wish list, their grievances, their um, future um, outlook for the city to be incorporated into the plan that is uh, required under the law in Malaysia. Um, the difference between this new local plan with the old ones is that we are consciously uh, putting the sustainable development uh, agendas into the plan, uh, whereas before it was only concerned about the physical and economical development. Right now, we put into place um, efforts into a greener development, more inclusive development, and engaging and empowering the local community. Uh, in fact, just last month, the Minister of Local Government recently launched this uh, national community policy, which is quite rare for the local government to do. Um, local government ministry to do because it was normally under the uh, social <clears throat> and community ministry. Mm -hmm. But we are concerned about the bottom 40 of the uh, communities uh, in the urban areas where relative poverty is quite apparent. Um, we are concerned that they do not have the ability to uh, organize among themselves um, to uh, collect enough funding to, to take care of their own environment, their own um, flatted houses. Um, so the national policy comes in um, with the help of um, putting up uh, offices uh, and guiding these local communities, especially the bottom 40s, um, into managing their own uh, livelihood, their own um, environment, and um, capacity buildings and um, looking into those marginalized society that may mm. be left behind. So now it is a conscious effort. Um, like Subang Jai itself has been tasked to become the first woman-friendly city. We don't hear about it before, but now um, to become the first woman-friendly city in Malaysia is quite a huge task because there is no um, formal indices on how to mm. measure whether you are 
really a woman-friendly city or not. So we have to come up with it. We have to do laps with the people asking what they want and um, creating our own indexes. Absolutely. Let, let me maybe just a quick follow-up question on that one because I think this is quite interesting. You said that as a mayor, you said that the central government is coming in supporting the communities directly in their efforts to implement the agenda. So what is your relationship as the local government then with these deconcentrated um, government institutions within your territory? Is there an institutional setup that makes you work together? So this is exactly the things that we're looking for, that we, that we try to understand, how to have the different levels working together. The local plan outlines the physical development, the economic development, and now um, the social development also within the city. After that, we have our strategic plan that outlines the shorter terms, uh, middle uh, range terms, what, like five years, of what action that needs to be done based on the five pillars of strategies that we aspire the, uh, the city to achieve. Um, downwards into the community, we have this formal residence committee, we call it residence committee, okay. uh, that uh, reports directly to the local authority uh, on the activities that they are doing because we are giving them funding to do uh, social programs, to do small projects, and um, to do initiatives for greener development and inclusive development. Mm -hmm. So uh, every year we have this interesting uh, concept of um, doing a competition among the smaller communities uh, by putting parameters on what to uh, achieve. Uh, just giving small uh, awards to them, encourage the smaller communities to compete within each other yes. and unconsciously or consciously, but we, we are the one uh, telling them more or less, they're outlining them what to do um, in accordance with social development goals. Okay. But they are the one uh, absorbing it and implementing it at the local level and when you give empowerment to them, it, is, it becomes naturally their own effort, their own um, Absolutely. Um, ability to, to, to uh, absorb the uh, sustainable development goals into their daily affairs. Many thanks. I think that, that clarified that a lot. Let me, let me um, um, hand over um, to Carlos. Of course, to give us a little bit the reality of a, of a municipality in Spain, but then maybe also that, because I, I mentioned that beforehand, universities as part of a local institutional setup to really promote the SDGs at the local level. Is that something that is also happening? So maybe just fracture that in if, if you can, if, as you have these kind of like dual backgrounds. Please. Es así como sería deseable que funcionara. Realmente eh, eh, la interacción entre, entre todos los actores, entre todas las, las administraciones sería lo correcto para un, para un adecuado desarrollo. Pero un adecuado desarrollo que tiene que partir, y tal como se está diciendo en esta mesa y en las anteriores, tiene que partir desde, desde lo local. ¿vale? Quiero, quiero empezar compartiendo la, la opinión de la ponente de la sesión plenaria cuando decía lo, lo, que lo mejor que le había pasado en su vida era ser alcaldesa de su pueblo. Estoy totalmente de acuerdo con ese, con ese planteamiento, eh, precisamente porque es donde realmente se aprende política. ¿vale? Mm. Cuando, cuando oigo aún el debate del servicio militar, sí, servicio militar, no, digo, déjate de servicio militar, pon los seis meses de concejal y sabrá lo que es la mili. A partir de ahí, todos los ciudadanos, si todos los ciudadanos pasaran realmente por la administración local, si todos los políticos pasaran por la administración local, realmente sabríamos lo que es la atención al ciudadano y la atención concreta a los problemas del día a día. Hablamos de la, de la Agenda 2030, una agenda de estrategia, una agenda largoplacista. Realmente, ¿qué puedo hacer yo por, un, por los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible desde un municipio de 620 habitantes? Pues bueno, puedo hacer yo y puedo hacer cada uno de esos 620 habitantes. Porque también hablamos de una agenda transformadora y hablamos de una agenda transformadora cuando estamos hablando de algo que hemos hecho siempre. Siempre hemos atendido los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. Lo que pasa es que los habíamos perdido de vista, habíamos perdido la referencia, habíamos por un momento dejado de focalizar ese, esa visión en esos objetivos y nos habíamos dedicado a hacer políticas grandilocuentes. ¿vale? Tenemos que volver a centrar el foco en lo más importante de la política, en las personas. 
Las personas al final son el objetivo y el, y el, el objetivo último de toda administración. Sin administrados, sin personas, no tiene por qué haber administraciones. Por tanto, es absurdo que nos planteemos macropolíticas cuando la política importante es la que tenemos que atender al ciudadano. Y esa es la que se presta desde el ámbito local. Y esa es la que se presta especialmente desde el ámbito local en tamaños tan reducidos como el que tengo la suerte yo de, de, de presidir. Eh, afortunadamente, la Federación Española de Municipios eh, asumió el reto de coordinar a los ayuntamientos en este gran reto, que son las, los ODS. Realmente los ayuntamientos, volvemos a la pregunta, ¿qué puedo hacer yo? Pues probablemente yo, desde mi ayuntamiento, solo, poco. Estamos hablando de una cantidad de objetivos, de una cantidad de grandes objetivos con un alcance muy importante, que ayuntamiento por ayuntamiento no pueden hacer nada, pero con una buena coordinación, con una adecuada coordinación, sí que, sí que lo pueden hacer. Pretendemos una sociedad más justa, una sociedad más libre y una sociedad más igualitaria. Vale, al final estamos hablando de un rol esencial de los ayuntamientos, ese rol esencial que defiende la Federación Española desde un plan de acción que realmente lo que pretende es que haya una responsabilidad en la gestión local, una responsabilidad en la gestión política desde los ayuntamientos, que al final es la que nos tiene que llevar a conseguir esos grandes objetivos. El principio del ODS 16, el de las instituciones y sociedades eh, pacíficas, justas e inclusivas, al final es el que tiene que definir un poco esa gestión local, es el que tiene que definir un poco esa, esa gran gestión política. ¿no? Tendremos que hablar de transparencia, tenemos que hablar de acceso a la información, de rendición de cuentas, de participación ciudadana, pero todo esto solo lo podemos conseguir con unos adecuados cauces de comunicación. No podemos hablar de participación cuando el ciudadano no entiende lo que la administración está diciendo. No podemos hablar de transparencia cuando estamos tras, eh, trasladando documentos que son totalmente ilegibles a la opinión pública. Tenemos que estar hablando un lenguaje que los demás puedan entender, porque la comunicación no es comunicación si no es bidireccional. Si no conseguimos una comunicación de ida y vuelta, si no mm. conseguimos ser transmisores, pero al mismo tiempo receptores de esa comunicación, realmente los cauces se han roto. Entonces, lo que tendremos que buscar de alguna forma es volver a, a enfocar a la administración local. Lo que tenemos que procurar es volver a enfocar a la administración local como el escenario propicio por ser una entidad de cercanía y de referencia del ciudadano. Cuando un vecino tiene un problema, no se va a la ventanilla de la administración autonómica, no se va a la ventanilla del ministerio, se va a su ayuntamiento y, si puede, al despacho de su alcalde. Y le plantea el problema, e intenta que le planteen y que le encuentren una solución y, a partir de ahí, empezamos a gestionar y empezamos a mover las distintas administraciones que, que tienen que haber. Al final, la, la federación lo que pretende con esto son tres eslabones básicos, que es acción, participación y cooperación. ¿Acción por qué? Porque los ODS no dejan de ser competencias de, los, de las administraciones locales. Participación, porque deben implicar a todas las administraciones locales, a todas las administraciones por encima del ámbito mm. municipal, a todas las administraciones transversales, como es el caso de las universidades, y por supuesto a toda la ciudadanía, porque si no, no hay posibilidad ninguna de alcanzar esos ODS. Lo que tenemos que procurar, por supuesto, es esa implicación de toda la sociedad en un objetivo común, como son los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible. ¿Esto por dónde pasa? Por un reto político grandísimo y muy difícil de afrontar, no tengo ninguna duda que es el reto de hacer un nuevo reparto competencial, una nueva confianza en los ayuntamientos. Los ayuntamientos hemos demostrado, y lo llevamos demostrando ya durante muchos años, que somos mayores de edad, que sabemos gestionar nuestros recursos, que sabemos trabajar con nuestros vecinos, con nuestros vecinos, no para nuestros vecinos, que hay una diferencia importante en el, en el, en el adverbio. Eh, tenemos que buscar cómo esa, ese nuevo reparto competencial, además, viene aparejado de, de una redefinición del sistema de financiación. Aquí no queremos que nos den dinero, queremos que nos dejen donde el dinero está, donde nosotros tengamos los recursos que necesitamos para poder trabajar en esos objetivos de atender a la ciudadanía. Y en ese reparto competencial, además, eh, conseguir una mayor dinamización social y conseguir que los vecinos se sientan implicados en la gestión. No. Uh, many thanks, and, and, and saying also, as I have mentioned with others, um, we do very much valorize the work of FEMP. Of course, we are, we are partnering, and I think it's very important to see this, this role of institutions like associations of local and regional governments, that they're doing as a multiplier, as really as a, as, as a space where learning can happen, as a space where also political and lobbying commitment can be done. One maybe a bit provoking question to you, maybe as a follow-up. We do have elections. We do have change in parties, and we have an agenda that is 30 years long. So, would we change our approach every four years, or might maybe a focus on strengthening local institutions help us to overcome that kind of like 
um, changing political environments that we might see. Um, sí que es, sí que es. Sí que es una pregunta provocativa, de verdad. Eh, realmente no podemos estar modificando cada cuatro años una estrategia que está definida a 15 años, porque entonces no hay estrategia, no hay camino, no hay camino. Lo que tenemos es que fortalecer el ámbito democrático de participación, porque al final, de la misma forma que son los ciudadanos quienes deciden si existe ese cambio político o no existe ese cambio político, son los ciudadanos los que tienen que tener claro cuál es la estrategia que estamos trazando. No podemos hablar de una estrategia 2030 teniendo en cuenta que van a haber hasta tres o cuatro, no sé exactamente, elecciones municipales por el camino. No sabemos cuántas elecciones generales al paso que vamos en España, no sabemos cuántas elecciones autonómicas. Si nosotros estamos buscando una estrategia largoplacista, nos tenemos que quitar la venda cortoplacista. Esa venda cortoplacista que, que afecta muchísimo porque al final eres consciente que cada cuatro años vas a pasar un examen. Que cada cuatro años los vecinos te van a evaluar y que cada cuatro años tú tienes que dar esa rendición de cuentas adecuada a tus objetivos. Pero lo que tendremos que procurar es plantear los objetivos desde el principio de forma que sepamos que cada cuatro años ese examen parcial se supera y permite continuar con esa estrategia aunque haya un cambio de partidos. Absolutamente. Muchas gracias. Before opening to the public, um, one more, um, um, please. In reaction to the other panelists, yeah. I assume. I was absolutely impressed by all, uh, let's say, experiences, uh, two or three things. The first one is when we are reflecting on localizing, uh, we have not just uh, to look at it uh, from the top to uh, the down, and so it, the localizing uh, approach has to be come from the local as well. Otherwise, it is just implementing what is already decided and so on. I agree with you that. Uh, planification has to be in place, but uh, I have always uh, some hesitation that the local has just to implement what is decided at another level. Why? Because the local is the most endemic yeah, uh, uh, feeling and situation where you are confronted every day with uh, all kinds of uh, goals we have to reach. Density of population, density of housing, traffic jam, so I was saying uh, to the commissioner that, that, at that time, it's wonderful to go for the goals 2030 on behalf of the union, but uh, please, you cannot uh, achieve it because 70% of all achievements had to be done, uh, are to be done at the local, first thing. The second point is, uh, I think that we all feel that without decentralization of power, I think that the local will fail, and there we are always uh, uh, to focus to two points. You need at the local the human capital, the expertise, and when there is not a transfer of human capital and expertise from the top to, let's say, the basic, we will fail. And the second point is uh, related to this uh, uh, main issue. There has to be the budget and the financial means because the old proverb, the English one, no taxation without representation, no representation without taxation. And this is uh, obvious. And lastly, just uh, two or three examples, what can be done concretely? I see in uh, Spain, the Basque country has achieved a lot of things by what we can call to territorialize the global goals. And there they were uh, really going to uh, what uh, has to be done at their responsibility. Another example, in the Netherlands, we are facing, it depends from country to country, where the rural and the urban are in fact uh, intermixed. You can in the Netherlands, part of Belgium, other countries and so on, you cannot say this is the confine uh, of the mm -hmm. urban. And that's the reason why we were working on uh, widening the urban agenda to what in the meantime is called the rural urb, the rural urban being uh, together. A third example, practically, that uh, the local people in Finland were asking the parliament to uh, uh, think with them, to discuss with them, and so on. So the real point is that uh, we have to have in mind that there has to be an impact assessment on what was done and what was projected in whatever planning we have to do. And there has to be yeah, an aggregation 
on the different levels, together with the social partners, uh, to make it. It's not easy, and there I think that uh, we have to take everybody on board, uh, and, uh, but the impact assessment is very important, otherwise it is uh, that somewhere in the cloud, yeah, where you cannot touch it, so the delivery has to be in place, otherwise uh, we will fail uh, all. But I think that uh, experienced and by the expertise and the good practices of the one, we can learn from each other as well. So uh, it is global thinking, but it is local acting. Thank you very much. I would even like to, because I had the pleasure to be part of that, the work that is now done by the Committee of Region with UCLG, we were also associated a little bit, is an ex ante impact assessment for policies, for the implementation. And I think this is also an important point because basically what will, us, what will help us and enable us to implement the agenda is good public policies. So knowing the impact and having possibilities to assess the impact within the territory is an approach that is very interesting, not only afterwards to measure, which is of course extremely important also. Uh, let me quickly open it to see if there is one or the other questions that we want to have. We have already one. Um, please be short and precise. We will look for a mic, definitely, if there is one. Would we have a microphone at one point? Yes. Um, and we will try then in the, in the final round to take in the different, different aspects. Please. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I have a small comment, could, actually. Could you introduce yourself? My please? name is Ola Sidani. I'm from the Government of Lebanon, Presidency of Council of Ministers. Concerning the uh, strengthening institutions versus uh, changing the policies uh, every four years that uh, you discussed, in Lebanon we established a national committee for SDGs. Its members are the director generals of the ministries. We chose them to be director generals in order to ensure sustainability of policy decision making at a very high level. So they are not ministers that change and they are not le lower levels that are not decision makers. So this allows for sustainability in the policies. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at that point, please, the gentleman in the fourth. Merci. J'ai beaucoup uh, aimé et apprécié l'analyse de Monsieur le ministre marocain. Cependant, il y a eu beaucoup de projets qui rentrent dans le cadre des ODD qui sont menés par les collectivités locales marocaines, parce que nous faisons la même chose en Tunisie depuis longtemps. Je, vous cite, je veux vous citer quatre ou cinq exemples. La stratégie des villes, le développement des villes, c'est l'un des projets les plus réussis qui est cité dans toute l'Afrique et par toutes les institutions internationales au Maroc et qui pr préconise la, la participation citoyenne et tous les... Ah. L'opération de... de euh, le, les oasis, qui est une action municipale qui a bien réussi, qui donne beaucoup d'exemples. Le transfert de toutes les subventions par le FEC ne, ne se fait qu'à travers des, une participation et une notation obligatoire pour la durabilité et pour d'autres choses. Et j'en cite beaucoup de projets. Le problème à, à, à notre niveau, que ce soit pour la Tunisie ou pour le Maroc, et je vous pose la question, c'est un problème de communication. L'État a le moyen de faire beaucoup de tapage de communication. Par contre, les collectivités locales ne sont pas dans cette règle-là. Donc, autant renforcer cette question de formation de communication pour, pour renforcer l'intégration de communes dans les ZOD. Merci. Thank you very much. If we have another one at the moment, if not, we hand it back to the panel. But I invite you. Please. Ya, ya que tengo el micrófono, voy a aprovechar también para hacer una pregunta. Buenas tardes, soy Gemma Aguado de PNUD. Muchísimas gracias a todos los panelistas por sus intervenciones tan interesantes. Querría preguntar especialmente a la señora Alciria. Sabemos que la Agenda 2030 nos da una oportunidad también para reforzar la transparencia de las instituciones, la rendición de cuentas a los ciudadanos. Y me preguntaba de, si desde el ministerio que usted representa hay algún mecanismo en particular en marcha que les haya resultado especialmente útil para reforzar todos estos procesos de, de mejora de transparencia, accountability y rendición de cuentas. Gracias. Please. Um, I think there was one question addressed to you and then we, 
we hand over. Please. Merci. Alors, merci beaucoup. Euh, en fait, euh, je vais commencer par un petit commentaire parce que c'est une question qui est revenue trois fois maintenant, la, la question des changements. Est-ce que euh, les élections vont apporter des changements On a donné euh, un certain nombre de, de solutions de garantie, des stratégies à long terme, c'est nécessaire. Des comités de directeurs, euh, oui, mais par exemple chez nous, les directeurs dépendent aussi du ministre. Le ministre qui arrive a la possibilité de changer ses directeurs. Bon, mais après, c'est pas grave. Moi, je pense à la sensibilisation du, du citoyen. Le degré de sensibilisation de la population est aussi une garantie pour éviter ces, ces, ces changements. Et il faut, il faut, et vous l'avez, enfin, quelqu'un l'a dit en parlant de communication, ben oui, la communication et la sensibilisation. D'ailleurs, les, tous les modes opératoires d'évaluation, de mise en œuvre et d'évaluation insistent sur le diagnostic, la sensibilisation, la, la participation. Je ferme la parenthèse, je reviens à la, à la question euh, du Maroc. Vous avez raison, Monsieur le ministre, il n'y a pas que cela. Je n'ai pas voulu citer... On a un exemple typique, l'Initiative nationale de développement humain, qui a fait des progrès sur le plan de la de la lutte contre la pauvreté, de, des activités génératrices de revenus pour les familles, les, les, les familles faibles. Mais c'est ce que je voulais dire quand je me suis posé la question, est-ce qu'il a fallu attendre 2015 pour, pour, pour faire ce travail On le fait bien avant, on le fait toujours, et c'est ça qui est important. Aujourd'hui, il faut qu'on le fasse savoir, mais qu'on le mette dans un cadre qui puisse le faire savoir et le, faire, et le, et le mesurer. Euh, en fait, les collectivités territoriales, communes, provinces et régions font de la poésie comme M. Jourdain sans, sans le savoir. De, depuis longtemps, nous ne faisons que ça. Maintenant, il faut qu'on le fasse savoir et je crois que nous avons les moyens par la subsidiarité dont on a parlé, par la décentralisation et surtout la déconcentration. Aujourd'hui, les ministères sont obligés de céder des compétences aux, aux régions et nous, la loi vient de, de sortir. Merci. Let, let me maybe just ask a follow-up question because, I mean, I, I started thinking when you, when you said we are doing the things since long. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. There's a lot of good things are done. There is a lot of participatory methods, also the regionalization in Morocco and so on, and the advanced regionalization that you have done. But isn't the agenda as we have it today, like this, this 2030 agenda, it lets us do a, another look at the processes that we're doing. So, I would want to get to that point in between how can participation reach really to that what we are always saying, leave no one behind. Is there a need or have you in Morocco maybe reviewed your processes, institutional processes, to do that step from participating? Because we many times we participate with the same actors, not so in Morocco, but from my own experience. But now really to embrace all the different excluded groups. Do you have any, any experience in that one? Has the agenda there really stimulated you to, to do another step forward? Alors, effectivement, et euh, là aussi, parce qu'on a un temps limité, je n'ai pas voulu m'étendre, euh, le Maroc a, a je ne dis pas qu'il a réussi, il a, il a accompli un certain nombre d'objectifs de l'OMD, déjà avant, avant l'ODT. L'OMD, on a réduit la, le, le taux de pauvreté, par exemple, de, de 10-11% à 5% mmh. environ. Ça ne veut pas dire que c'est satisfaisant. Non, il y a toujours la pauvreté, il y a toujours la malheur. Aujourd'hui, précisément, toutes les actions qui se font, quand j'ai parlé de décentralisation, de donner du pouvoir aux communes, à la plus petite commune, c'est précisément pour lui permettre d'avoir un œil sur, sur l'ensemble de sa population. Avoir l'œil, c'est très important. Avoir l'œil la, et l'argent, c'est encore mieux. Alors là, l'argent, ça commence. C'est difficile. Nous avons beaucoup de petites communes, sur les 1600 communes, mmh. beaucoup de petites communes ont juste de quoi payer les fonctionnaires et faire quelque chose. Mais nous sommes sur cette voie, justement. Et c'est là que je dis que l'apport de l'agenda de 2030 est intéressant pour nous, parce que comme nous sommes obligés à une reddition des comptes, à une évaluation pour savoir où c'est que nous en sommes, nous pouvons même faire des comparaisons. La première comparaison est sortie en décembre entre les différentes, les 12 régions du Maroc globalement, mais il faut descendre encore plus bas pour faire cela. Voilà. Merci beaucoup. Um, any other take? There were questions from the public. Alfidia, would you like to, to, to respond? And then also, please, feel free. 
thank you. Uh, Cape Verde, uh, very recently in 2008, for the first time, uh, we elaborated our state budget uh, in consultation with the private sector and civil society. And to promote transparency, we, we published the, the state budget uh, at the, the government website. And we are also promoting uh, with the parliament uh, initiatives of open parliament, uh, where both parliament and the civil society, they can follow the implementation of the budget and uh, all the financial uh, uh, resources. Um, what we, we are also doing, uh, we did include a gender, gender marker in our budget, it's something very new for us. And we are also elaborating a white paper on public administration uh, to, to, to have like the feedback of the people that are using the, the public administration. Thank you, Ephraim. I would like to bring our discussion to the measurement of the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, local authorities in Malaysia are required to uh, complete this um, indexes that is designed for the whole country so that we can measure among ourselves. Uh, this indexes includes from governance to finance to um, community uh, development to environmental preservation and it, it is quite comprehensive. Uh, before this was done, we don't really have any ideas where we are as far as the sustainable development agenda is concerned. But mm -hmm. once the indexes is um, made compulsory to all the local authorities, we can measure among ourselves. Of course, it's going to be uh, different uh, at the international levels. And some of us have tried to measure ourselves uh, internationally so that we know where we lag behind. Mm -hmm. um, we also have uh, two types, actually three types. All the local authorities in Malaysia have to do three types of measurement. One is the star rating, we call it, um, where the national government give awards to uh, the local government that achieves um, up to five stars. Uh, the state level itself has a similar um, evaluation, but uh, with a different um, emphasis on the state uh, policies. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we have another one, we call it sustainable um, indices, that uh, we measure ourselves um, um, with the uh, global um, agenda and goals. So um, I think in that manner, it forces all the local authorities to be uh, abreast with the universal um, goals, uh, with the um, efforts of other local authorities. It, 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 it's very interesting. Maybe let me ask you a follow-up question on this measurement that you really as local government are doing on the achievements. Do you include and are you engaging the civil society and or also the private sector in that process? Uh, not yet, uh, but 10% uh, of our marks comes from how the public views us as the local authority, whether we have been effective in addressing their um, requirement, their needs, and uh, their wishes, mm -hmm. uh, but not yet to the effect that um, whether they think that we comply with the uh, sustainable development goals. Okay, thanks. Is there any experience on monitoring or measuring at the local level in, in, in the public on, of the SDGs? Because I think it is one of the issues that really is a little bit a blank spot yet. No, there are individual experiences, but we don't have really a systematic uh, body of work. Um, can monitoring and measuring the SDGs at the local level strengthen that kind of like ownership of the SDGs? Can that help us to create more accountable institutions and more accountable policies? No? And, 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 and if so, how would such a local system need to look like? Um, maybe I give it back if we don't have so much feedback in the audience there. If someone would have an idea or if something like this is happening in, in, in some of your territories, have you thought about how that kind of monitoring at the local level, including maybe the civil society, can really 
strengthen accountability mechanisms, strengthen the ownership of the agenda, or are we not yet there? I know that very little is done yet, but maybe, maybe we have some ideas in Ecuador. Um, Gustavo, what, what is the... ¿Cuál es, cuál es el yo, yo, yo creo que es una eficiencia de carácter general. Mm. Eh, lo decía Mauricio Rojas, ahora el alcalde de Quito en, en Nueva York, han encontrado niveles de indicadores que permitan ver el avance y obviamente permitan desarrollar estrategias. Pero los indicadores deben ser desde lo mínimo local. Ahí está la realidad. Ahí, no hay en otro lado. Y esa realidad en nuestro, en nuestro país se llama parroquia, que es la unidad más pequeña administrativa, administrativa política, son los hombres y mujeres de ese territorio los que no tienen hábitat, casa, no tienen ingresos. La extrema pobreza está mucho más incrementada ahí que en, el, en lo urbano. Y obviamente si no se toman indicadores desde ahí, es imposible desarrollar una estrategia real que pueda solucionar los problemas en cada uno de estos espacios. Creo que han tocado muchísimos temas importantes, problemas como el tema de las elecciones. Yo en dos meses tengo que dejar la prefectura y sí me duele que muchos de los programas posiblemente no tengan continuidad. Pero es mucho más importante el tema y posiblemente no tengamos discusión en la territorialización y en la localización de los dos ODS. Pero es importante igualmente entender de que los gobiernos locales, que los gobiernos subnacionales somos imprescindibles para eso. Somos imprescindibles, no es un tema de ego, es un tema de necesidad. Quisiera compartir con ustedes lo que ha pasado con el tema de la pobreza multidimensional en nuestro país. Una pobreza que se mide el tema de la vivienda, una pobreza que se mide con el tema de necesidades básicas insatisfechas, con el ingreso y el consumo. Y resulta que en el 2015, cuando empiezan todos los objetivos de desarrollo social en nuestro país, este índice estaba en el 67%. Vamos a diciembre del 2018 y está en el 67.7. Si vamos al tema nacional, este es en el sector rural. Vean, vean el índice tan alto. Uh -huh. Si vamos al, al nivel nacional, este estaba en diciembre del 2015 en el 37 y ahora lo tenemos en el 37.9. Y si vamos en lo urbano, en diciembre se encontraba en el 24, ahora estamos en el 23.9. No, 23 y sube al 23.9. Algo está pasando, algo está pasando. No sé si sea la realidad de mi país solamente, pero algo está pasando. Y bien el alcalde lo mencionaba, la necesidad urgente de la coordinación. Existe un, un, un instrumento fundamental que es el gobierno multinivel. La necesidad urgente de la, de la coordinación, es decir, las políticas públicas no se pueden generar desde el gobierno nacional sin conocer la realidad del territorio. Es decir, políticas públicas que pueden ser construidas colectivamente. Hay un tema grave de recursos. Nosotros pasamos un proceso de, de, de un déficit tremendo y un problema de liquidez enorme. Pero no será posible analizar si los gobiernos locales y los gobiernos nacionales podemos tener acceso a líneas de financiamiento externas y no que sea centralizado directamente con, con los gobiernos nacionales. Yo pregunto, dejo, dejo en el ambiente este interrogante. Y no será necesario y fundamental que la planificación, se fue el, el, el representante Flandes, él lo decía claramente, la planificación debe ser desde lo más mínimo expresión local y pasar por los diferentes niveles de gobierno. Debe contener esa planificación, lo municipal, lo provincial, estatal y lo nacional. Esa planificación impide pues, que se desvíen por qué la planificación estratégica del país contenida o que contiene hasta su más mínima expresión. Creo que es fundamental tener esos interrogantes y poderlos solucionar. Sin recursos no es posible, sin descentralización no es posible, sin planificación integral no es posible. Hoy esta mañana todavía preocupado que se habla de la planificación, la agenda urbana. Si no hay una agenda que contenga el desarrollo integral de lo rural y de lo urbano, no podemos avanzar. Yo no sé, si, repito, si la realidad de mi país sea diferente, pero si tengo, tengo pobreza multidisciplinaria, multidimensional en el sector rural que me llega al 27% y tengo en lo urbano que me llega al 24%, hay una disparidad y una inequidad enorme. Y esa inequidad entre lo rural y lo urbano hay que corregir. La gran ciudad se nutre de los alimentos producidos allá en lo rural. 
el agua viene de lo rural. Las grandes edificaciones vienen de los músculos del sector rural. Sin embargo, la extrema pobreza sigue enquistada allá y no acá. Ojalá lleguemos a tener lo que tenemos en la gran ciudad. Ese desarrollo de la planificación integral se vuelve fundamental. Y creo que debemos alrededor de eso también discutir profundamente. Estamos muy de acuerdo. We are, we are, I, I couldn't agree more. No? For example, the, the, the vertebra, the importance of an integrated planning, that is a multi-level integrated planning, is immense. Um, as UNDP, we have, for example, worked together with UCLG and together with UN Habitat on specifically that kind of element and how can the Agenda 2030 enrich local planning systems, integrated planning system, and how can the integrated planning system be um, the vector to really make the agenda happen. It's not to change old planning, because we all do planning. We do local planning, regional planning, but it's to look at the principles of planning, how we can be more um, embracive, more inclusive, and more integrated. Um, I have one um, first of, of, of Estebalis from the, um, from the Basque country that wanted to have the word, and then we will hand it over. Please, Esti. Thank you, Johannes. Eh, bueno, simplemente quería eh, compartir con todos ustedes una experiencia que estamos llevando a cabo en el, en el País Vasco, desde el Gobierno Vasco, eh, en este sentido de, de lo que estamos hablando de gobernanza multinivel y el diálogo de, entre in, diferentes eh, niveles de la Administración. Y eh, hemos eh, puesto en marcha, a raíz de haber aprobado nuestra propia digamos, agenda Euskadi Basque Country 2030 eh, a nivel del Gobierno, un grupo de trabajo con los diferentes eh, niveles de la administración. Hay tres provincias, los tres mayores ayuntamientos de, del País Vasco y la asociación de, de municipios. Y es un proceso, porque digo que está costando, y sobre todo un proceso en el que estamos eh, conociéndonos también. Eh, nos está dando la oportunidad de conocernos entre, entre todos nosotros. Y lo que estamos persiguiendo es llegar a un documento común desde el respeto de ese reparto competencial que ya, que ya nos hemos dotado y de esa planificación que cada una de esas instituciones nos hemos dotado, pero ir eh, como contribuyendo y aportando cada una desde su propia digamos, dimensión y competencia a un documento común de Agenda Euskadi 2030 en ese mm, eh, respeto interinstitucional ¿no? y llegando a un mismo esta contribución vasca a la Agenda 2030 desde cada una de nuestras propias actividades. Es un proceso que, que, que va lento, pero yo creo que creemos mucho en los procesos y en ir afianzando ese, esa confianza mutua, ese empatizar, ese ser generosos a la hora de, 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 de aportar en estas acciones comunes eh, que todo va en pro de la Agenda 2030. Gracias por todo. Muchísimas gracias, Esti. Tenemos... Uh, we have another one, I think. The lady at the second row, Gemma, will come with the microphone. We will have a possibility to have a final, final reaction, short one, some impressions. What would be the takeaway of, of each of us, maybe, and, and one last message? No? So we will, we will then proceed to this one, and Good maybe afternoon. we can also answer. Good afternoon, Sorry. everyone. I'm Maribel from the Philippines. Uh, you're right in saying that evaluation is really important. What we cannot measure, we'll not be able to accomplish. So in the Philippines, as early as 2016, we developed the Philippine Development Plan, and with it, we defined the results matrix of the Philippine Development Plan. That Philippine Development Plan is highly influenced by the SDGs, by our commitment to climate change and our peace and order issues. This results matrix is translated down to the local government level. So it's a work that is ongoing in the country, but we still have to look at 2030 and probably look at possibility of doing ROI on investments on SDGs we probably have to ask ourselves, how much are we investing in SDGs and what are the results that we are creating out of these investments? This probably can be, can some, is something that countries can do with the help of uh, international institutions. But I would like to raise in the discussion the issue of accountability. For 2030, I think accountability should just not just rest on government alone. 
we've tested in the Philippines a way of letting families be accountable for their SDGs. So they look, uh, they assess their own levels of SDGs and find solutions to the gaps that they're able to identify. Solutions that mm. they can do on their own as a family and solutions that would need government intervention. What I'm driving at is we need to change the mindset that SDGs are plain and simple accountability of government. It should not be. It is accountability of everyone. So from entitlements that citizens would ask, there has to be a corresponding definition of responsibilities of citizens. I think that that's the kind of change that we have to look forward to in 2030. If we want that everyone, nobody is left behind, there, then everybody has to be in that process of achieving the SDGs from assessment to response and evaluation. Thank you very much. Let us maybe be inspired of this change of mindset. I think, yes, that is needed. Have we achieved that so far? What do we take out of that discussion? And maybe one, one message and we go maybe in the order. Um, please, Madam Mayor. Empowering local communities. That would be the most important and most successful effort that I've done within my city. It makes our job easier. It makes um, the environment cleaner just by making the local community understand that they have responsibility, that we are here to help, and there's always the national policy to guide us. Um, once they are empowered, there is a sense of belonging, then we do not have to enforce or monitor them so much. Uh, secondly, it's important to measure how far we have gone into the implementation by setting ourselves certain standards, be it at the national level or at the international level, so that um, we can improve ourselves and measure uh, according to the acceptable standards. Perfect. Thank you. Carlos, maybe. Yo quería hacer un, un par de consideraciones eh, que considero importantes después de lo que se ha debatido. En primer lugar, hablamos de rendición de cuentas. Y hablamos de rendición de cuentas de la, de, ciudad, de la administración al ciudadano y del ciudadano a la administración. ¿no? La administración continuamente le está pidiendo al ciudadano que rinda cuentas, especialmente por motivos tributarios. Pero realmente el ciudadano no le pide esa rendición de cuentas a la administración con carácter generalizado, principalmente porque no se sienten partícipes, no se sienten implicados en esas políticas. ¿vale? Hay que recentralizar, como decía antes, la gestión en la, en la ciudadanía para que esa ciudadanía se sienta realmente el centro de esa gestión y a partir de ahí sí que pida esas cuentas a la, a la administración. Y a tenor de esto, a colación de esto, vendría la segunda consideración y es que considero que tenemos que romper el concepto actual del principio de subsidiariedad y redefinirlo. Hablamos continuamente de descentralización, hablamos continuamente de un sentido descendente de la administración, en nuestro caso la europea, estatal, autonómica, las diputaciones que se colocan en medio, los ayuntamientos, los ciudadanos. Tendríamos que plantearlo al revés, tendríamos que plantear una descentralización total y recentralizar aquellas políticas que consideremos que son mucho más eficientes o mucho más efectivas desde un ámbito centralizado, porque obviamente la vertebración del territorio no se puede desarrollar desde los ayuntamientos. Probablemente ese sería una ruptura grande del modelo pero probablemente sería empezar a construir desde una base sólida donde la definición de competencia sea la que sea. Cuando hablamos de un principio de una administración una competencia, a mí me parece perfecto, pero a mis ciudadanos, cuando no les llega esa competencia desde la administración autonómica, cuando no les llega desde esa administración estatal, a quien la van a reclamar es al ayuntamiento. Redefinamos el principio de subsidiariedad y desde esa redefinición construyamos un nuevo reparto competencial. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you, Carlos. Alcidia, Cabo Verde is in the process of, of regionalization, decentralization. Would that concept that was planted be of, of use for Cabo Verde? Well, I think that it, uh, all our colleagues were unanimous by saying that uh, the 17 objectives of the SDGs are not, are not new for the countries. For instance, Cape Verde since 75 is uh, working to end poverty, to reduce inequalities, and to promote uh, public transparency. But what we did find, uh, it was uh, something new, 
was the fact that uh, now we really think that a local government are the ones that are near to people and they are better fitted to implement it, uh, the, our policies. So for me, let's, let's keep in investing in decentralization, both of uh, service, human resources and financial resources to local governments. And uh, I think something that uh, my colleague here, he, he told us about the, if we don't want like every five years with elections, uh, with change of government to have like change of planning, we have, uh, we do need uh, to promote like plat these platforms that really involve mm -hmm. the ones that are working in the territory, like the private sector and the civil society. That's the only way we don't like get lost when every four years. Thank you. Thank you, Athena. Gustavo. Un, una idea última, un pensamiento. Sí. Eh, tal vez quisiera proponer algunas cosas. Estamos a a 11 años de la meta. Decían esta mañana, entre dos y tres procesos electorales. <risa> Se complica la cosa. ¿no? Y quisiera tal vez proponer en el qué hacer, que deberíamos desarrollar toda una propuesta de sensibilización de los ODS desde lo local. Creo que es fundamental esa concertación que, que muchos de los compañeros han llamado, donde participa el sector privado. El sector privado también debe ser responsable del cumplimiento de los objetivos de desarrollo. Creo que es fundamental el poder construir estos indicadores que, repito, deberían ser desde abajo de la más mínima expresión donde está la realidad y que sean de los diferentes sectores. Creo que es fundamental el flujo de recursos. Sin flujo de recursos esto también se nos queda como en el papel. No podríamos realmente aplicar las políticas para conseguir los objetivos de desarrollo. Y obviamente, partir del hecho de que la territorialización es necesaria, y repito, los gobiernos locales y nacionales son los imprescindibles. Muchas gracias. Now, um, as the last intervention, you, you had the perspective of the national level as an ex-minister of a president of a region, of the associations of region, um, in your political life. I think you are very well placed to maybe give us a little bit of an overview and the closing statement of that panel, please. No. Well, I just want to simply make a remark that there is no disagreement. There can not be one on the fact that the local level and the local level and the local level and the best space to be able to effectively affine La, les, les données et pour pouvoir faire participer le citoyen, faire participer la société civile et tout ça. Mais je suis, en, je suis inquiet parce que ce que j'entends, euh, subsidiarité, oui, déconcentration, décentralisation, oui, mais j'ai l'impression qu'on qu qu voudrait ou bien faire, faire, faire faire les plans au niveau national en faisant se remonter seulement les informations, ce n'est pas ça qu'on voulait, ou bien essayer d'autonomiser totalement les collectivités et on risque de produire des injustices et des inégalités encore parce que toutes les communautés n'ont pas, pas les mêmes compétences, n'ont pas enfin, les mêmes capacités. Moi, moi je, je voudrais surtout insister depuis ce matin et hier, je crois qu'on parlait du dialogue et de la, de, la, de, de la coordination verticale et horizontale. Oui, il faut corriger ce qui existe aujourd'hui, mais améliorer cette coordination entre l'échelon le plus bas et l'échelon central qui, qui, à mon sens, reste nécessaire qu'on le veuille ou non. Je suis dans une région, je milite pour euh, arracher le maximum de compétences, le maximum de ressources, mais je suis aussi dans un état unitaire et je pense qu'à un, un moment ou à un autre, c'est la, 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 la solidarité, c'est la coopération entre les différents échelons qui doit jouer. Comme dans ma région, la coopération également doit jouer avec les communes qui sont en bas. Voilà ce que je voulais dire. Well, many thanks, even though there would be enough substance for this to continue with the discussion, I'm pretty sure of your statement. Um, let me thank you all for, for the patience. Let me thank the, the distinguished panelists and maybe one applause for all of us and thanking for the intervention. <laughs>